Hello and welcome to the Current Science and Technology podcast from the Museum of Science in Boston. I'm your host, Megan Litweiler, bringing you interviews with guest researchers and our museum staff covering science and technology in depth. Today we're talking with Dr. Joe Chikelski, a condensed matter physicist at MIT and a collaborator with the Center for Integrated Quantum Materials. He studies exotic electronic states of matter. Basically, he makes brand new materials that behave in totally unique and unexpected ways. And he's here to tell us more about his work and how these discoveries could lead to some huge advances in technology. Thanks so much for joining us, Joe. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Before we dive into your research, what exactly are exotic states of matter? I can think of some states of matter, solid, liquid, and gas, but nothing seems very exotic about that. So exotic states of matter, uh, what that means really are, are things that fall outside the realm of our normal understanding. Um, and so that's fundamentally interesting because if it's some exotic state of matter that we don't understand, then there's some opportunity to learn new physics. Uh, but at the same time, an exotic state of matter is interesting because since we don't understand it very well, it might be able to do things that we couldn't normally have uh, predicted. Can you give us an example of an exotic state of matter? So I think one really interesting example of an exotic state of matter uh, was a, a superconductor discovered about 100 years ago. So a, a superconductor is similar to a metal and that it conducts electricity. But one thing nobody expected until it was discovered was that at very low temperatures, some metals can conduct electricity perfectly. So this was an exotic state of matter because people really didn't understand how it worked, uh, first of all. And then second of all, it did things that nobody expected. So do they all have to do with um, electronic properties? So that's, so that's definitely not true. Exotic states of matter are important across many branches of science. Uh, it turns out that my research group and many others in this uh, subfield of study are really interested in systems that have exotic electronic and magnetic properties because we have the tools to study them, and actually often they are the most useful for technology. So does this relate to the 2016 Nobel Prize in Physics, which I believe was awarded for theories that relate to these exotic states of matter? So that's, so that's exactly right. So Thales, Haldane, and Kosterlitz were awarded the Nobel Prize for theories that described exotic states of matter. And in particular, they weren't talking necessarily about the original kinds of superconductors, but more interesting, or what I would say more exotic types of superconductors, magnets, and something called the uh, uh, quantum hall insulator that were discovered in the 1970s and 1980s. So how did they describe those exotic states? So, so, what, so what these three uh, theoretical scientists did, which was really in the grand tradition of theoretical physics, was to bring a new branch of mathematics into physics to describe this new phenomenon. So this is something that, that's been going on for hundreds of years since Newton brought calculus uh, into physics to explain mechanics. Uh, what, the, what these three scientists did was to bring in the mathematics of topology to describe these new exotic states that had been, that had been discovered in the 20th century. What's topology? So uh, topology, uh, as I said, is a branch of mathematics, um, and it is a study in, uh, of geometry, but not maybe geometry in the way that we are normally familiar with it, with, with characterizing things by if they're circles or squares. Uh, one way of understanding topology is it instead characterizes things that are much more permanent about objects, and the, the most well-known example is how many holes an object has. So if you have a, a sphere, uh, even if you deform the sphere a lot, it still doesn't have any holes in it, but as soon as you punch one hole, that object is fundamentally different than the original sphere, and you've changed its, its topology. And what I would say is that it's amazing, really, that these, these physicists found a connection between that abstract mathematics and real properties of electronic solids. Okay, I think I'm getting this. It's like you have a solid ball of Play-Doh, and you can shape the ball into a bowl without changing its topology, but if you put a hole in it and make it a donut, now it's topologically different than the ball. And one way to understand why uh, there, there's something so fundamental about that is you can't have something like half a hole. You know, either you, either you change something has a hole or it doesn't or it has two holes or three holes. These objects are change in what you would call a, a stepwise fashion. So that's a very mathematical idea, and what that those ideas were applied to, for example, was similar behavior that had been seen in what we call quantum materials, in some kind of electromagnetic materials that also showed a stepwise, stepwise response. Okay, so when it comes to these quantum materials, we're not talking about holes and donuts. We're talking about electrical or magnetic properties. So these theorists applied this new type of math called topology to physics, and they were able to describe something new about these exotic states of matter. Is that correct? 
Yeah, that's exactly right. And so not only could they describe previously known phenomenon, but as was a, a hallmark of a great theory, they could also predict brand new physical phenomena that were later realized. And so those brand new physical phenomena that were later realized, does that tie into the research that you're doing? So what's so, so what was really important is that uh, originally the physical phenomena that were in these exotic states of matter that were described by this Nobel Prize winning work, uh, originally I think people thought those were very interesting phenomena, but they were confined to very extreme conditions of very low temperature or in the presence of high magnetic fields. But an important step forward took place about 10 years ago when people realized that the same kind of uh, topology that could, play to that could play a role in those exotic materials was actually much more widespread. And an example of such a, a state of matter, which is called a topological insulator, was predicted about 10 years ago, which is a very important element of my research and many other groups working in the subfield. So what is a topological insulator? A simple way to think about a topological insulator is that it is a, a conventional insulator, meaning it's sort of a, a bulk piece of material that doesn't con conduct electricity, but uh, on its surface is wrapped by a really uh, exotic conducting mode. And it, it's this surface mode which has some kind of uh, topological properties that, for example, protect it from being, from being scattered. So what exactly do they do? So they're called topological insulators, but they conduct electricity also? How does that work? So we refer to them as insulators because whether or not they're two-dimensional or three-dimensional, uh, inside the bulk of the material, they're not electrically conducting. But everywhere along their boundary, they're covered with a very exotic kind of conducting mode. So topological insulators are only mostly insulators. The inside does not conduct electricity, but you get this strange current that runs along the edge. This sounds like something totally new. Because before we knew there are things that can be insulators, things that can be conductors, semiconductors, even superconductors. But these topological insulators that you make are both an insulator and a conductor at the same time. So that's certainly true that the, in the case of topological insulator, it's like taking a boring old insulator and covering it with something very interesting. But to your point, actually what uh, has been kind of a theme in this field is the ubiquity of this kind of physics. Not only has it now been found in insulators, that there can be topological insulators, now even in metals, we think there can be topological metals, where there's a different kind of conduction that can happen on the surface. Similarly, we've had superconductors, which are in their own right very exotic and interesting, but now we think there are topological superconductors, which have even more interesting properties that are on their boundaries. So that seems huge. If you look at lots of different materials through this kind of lens of topology, it turns out a whole bunch of different things can have these weird electronic properties. So it sounds like what's really cool about topological insulators is not just that they're an insulator and a conductor at the same time, but there's also something unusual about the conducting edge. So what's so special about that edge? Yeah, you know, so, so, yeah so this is really at the heart of what people think might be the most useful aspect of these topological materials. Uh, so the idea with a, a, a normal conductor is if, for example, you scratch, if you scratch the surface of the normal conductor, then the conducting properties get worse because the charge-carrying electrons will scatter off of the scratch. So the idea with, say, a topological insulator uh, is the idea that the conducting mode is something that is only a property of its electronic topology. So if I, if I go back to the analogy of topology and geometry, if I have an object that has, that has a hole, and I say scratch the surface, it doesn't change the fact that it still has one hole in it, right? In, in much the same way, if I have a topological insulator which has a topological conducting mode, if I make some superficial scratch or, or deformation to the material, it doesn't change its conducting properties. So it's the topological part of the topological insulator that gives it these amazing properties. So it has this ability to conduct electricity along its edge in a way that even if you threw something in front of it or destroyed it, it would still just keep going. So that is, re that is really the promise of the materials. That is, that is what topology brings to electronics. So topological insulators aren't something that you can just dig out of the ground, right? You actually make these in your lab. Is that correct? So it's true that we make them in the laboratory, but uh, maybe one surprising thing is that actually there are many naturally, uh, naturally occurring minerals which are topological insulators. So uh, early on in this subfield, when I was still a faculty member at University of Tokyo, uh, through ser searching through some mineral records, we found that there was a mineral called kawazulite uh, that was actually naturally occurring and appeared in some silver mine in a nearby prefecture. Uh, 
but unfortunately, that mine had closed in 1959. It was a silver mine that closed down, and now it's overgrown by vegetation, so you can't actually find those minerals anymore, and we had to resort to making them in the lab. But the important thing is that we could take this cue from nature about the structure of these compounds uh, as a pathway towards making them. Oh, so you actually can dig them out of the ground. So then why do you have to make them in your lab? So an important thing about a mineral that you can find in the ground is that even though the Earth does a tremendous job of growing crystals by using high pressure and high temperature, one thing that the Earth does badly is control the environment in which a crystal grows. So even though you want it to be only made, be made out, of, out of a few elements, it can have many impurities from the materials nearby. So something we can do in the laboratory is control that environment and grow much purer materials where it's easier to get at the really exotic nature of, say, a topological insulating state. And what are some of the elements that you use to make topological insulators? So I think one of the most exciting things about the field is the vast number of compounds which have now been predicted to be topological insulators. So in the very beginning, the idea was that originally there were just a small family of compounds based on binary or ternary uh, uh, compounds having two or three elements uh, or semiconductors based on bismuth. But what has become interesting is that as theorists have worked harder to find this physics in other materials, now we found that almost every element on the periodic table can be used to make topological insulators. And sometimes they're simple combinations of just two elements. Sometimes we have to combine together five elements to make, to make these materials happen. But basically, if a theorist predicts some, some new compound should be a, a topological insulator, we will work hard with the periodic table in our furnaces in order, order to realize it. What are some of the techniques you use to make or grow these topological insulators? They're crystals? So what's usually important for the study of topological insulators or, or, to, or any kind of topological material is to have a high-quality single crystal. So if we know, for example, from an electronic structure calculation that a crystal of uh, bismuth and selenium together makes a good topological insulator, what we can do, for example, is buy those high-purity elements from some company where they're, they, they dig them out of a mine, and then we can combine them together to grow crystals. My laboratory, as, as, many other, uh, as many other labs also have, we have a wide variety of ways of combining elements. So some things are, are simple. You can take two elements and mix them together with a catalyst at room temperature to make a crystal. Sometimes we have to mix them together and go to very high temperature. We have furnaces that can go to 3,000 degrees Celsius, half the temperature of the surface of the sun, right, in order to melt things together. Uh, and sort of using one of these techniques or somewhere in between, we can almost always combine elements. Now that you can actually make these things and work with them, what are, what are some of the things that you can do with them? So I think one way of understanding what topological materials could be good for is that there's some sort of protection of some surface or, or edge, edge mode, right? And so when you think about what you could actually do with them, you can look at different classes of topological materials and understand what exact property is being protected. So in the case of topological insulators, uh, there's this idea that they are uh, robust against things like scratches or deformations. If you, say, scratch the electronic material, it would still conduct very well. There are other kinds of topological insulators which involve magnetism, and in these cases, you get uh, perfectly conducting currents on the edges or the surfaces. And you could imagine if we could make that property work at high temperature, we could make uh, low, low energy loss transmission lines out of these systems. And maybe one of the most exciting is topological superconductors. And the hope in, tho in those cases is that they might be useful for quantum computing. Wow. So it sounds like there's a lot of potential for topological insulators to be harnessed for new types of technology. But how far off are we from actually realizing those kind of applications? It's true that it could be a long way uh, for a lot of these applications. Still, most of what we can do is confined to low temperature. Uh, things that are in the closer term, uh, we, are a lot, we are very much motivated by the presence of some topological materials in existing electronic devices. So long before we knew about topological insulator, some of these same materials, notably uh, things like bismuth telluride or bismuth selenide, were already being used in application. Uh, and it's in a field called thermoelectrics. So thermoelectrics are materials that can convert waste heat back into useful energy. And it turns out that bismuth telluride, something now known to be a topological insulator, is one of the world's best thermoelectrics. So a hope in the near term is that we could build on this existing technology and bring in topological protection in things like bismuth telluride and bismuth selenide to make some sort of topological thermoelectric that would improve its performance really in the near term. Wow, so we've been using these materials for these different kinds of applications and no one had any idea that they had these amazing properties as topological insulators. At least since the 1950s or 1960s, it was well known that these materials were great thermoelectrics and came a little bit as a surprise to the community that they turned out, turned out to be topological insulators. Wow, that's amazing. 
Well, it sounds like we're a long way off from actually seeing topological insulators in our everyday lives. But as someone who's working with these materials every day in your lab, what do you find so fascinating about topological insulators and their potential? So I think there's one very specific uh, uh, direction in topological insulators that we've been studying, which shows a lot of promise, and that is combining those exotic states with magnets. So magnets themselves are interesting quantum mechanical objects. We don't normally think about that because they operate at very human temperature scales. Uh, but there's an idea that by combining magnets with topological insulators, we could make things that could conduct electric uh, electricity perfectly, just like superconductors that operate at the temperature scale of magnets. So that means just like your kitchen magnet can go on the refrigerator uh, at room temperature, we could have things like superconductors that, that operate at the same, same scales. And so to give some context, there has been a long history of trying to increase the temperature at which superconductivity operates. And this uh, new direction of combining topological insulators and magnets might be an alternate path to realizing this room temperature perfect conduction. So as we're wrapping this up, what do you think is next for this field? So I think one of the most exciting things uh, in the subfield of uh, topological materials is the really rapid scientific development that's taken place in the last few years. Uh, so to give you some context, when I was a graduate student getting, getting ready for my PhD defense, uh, Duncan Haldane was on my thesis committee, one of the fellows who just won the Nobel Prize uh, for theories for exotic topological states of matter. So I really, really wanted to make sure at that time, it was far before the Nobel Prize, but I still wanted to understand at that time what topology really meant in the context of condensed matter physics. And I remember having a long discussion slash argument with other students in my laboratory at the chalkboard, just trying to understand what the meaning of topology really was for the systems we were studying. So if I flash forward to just a few years later, now I have undergraduate students in my lab who have such a facility with the language and the understanding of topology that they can really very easily understand what those theoretical ideas have to do with our real electronic materials. And so now I think that's emblematic of the idea that it has become very natural for topology to be intertwined with condensed matter physics. And the exciting thing is that as these students have become trained, it seems like they're going to be in a perfect position to uh, discover the really exciting, uh, exciting new exotic topological insulators of the future. So there's a lot of potential now for these new up and coming scientists to be just going right into these new fields with a lot more understanding than maybe you or some of the people who were coming up with these original theories. For us, it was really like learning a new, a new language of topology and feeling a little bit alien getting into it. But now it's very, very much a natural part of condensed matter physics. And I think that will allow a lot of new doors to be opened. Well, this has been a fascinating look into some of these topological materials and their potential. And for a lot of folks who are not physicists, I think you've helped turn an incredibly complicated topic into something we can all start to wrap our heads around. So I want to thank you for joining me today and for sharing some of the wonder of your scientific discoveries with us. It's been a pleasure chatting with you. It's a very exciting time. Thanks so much for having me. That's it for this week's show, but be sure to come back next time for more of the latest in science and technology. This podcast is a production of Current Science and Technology at the Museum of Science in Boston, part of the Boston community for over 180 years. For more information, visit our website at mos.org or email us at podcast at mos.org. Thanks for listening. <laughs>